Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Just having uh, the numbers starting to come through on the participants. Uh, from wherever you're dialing in, we've got a truly international audience today. Um, so it's either good morning, good afternoon or good evening to some of you. Uh, we have people dialing in, I can see from the United Kingdom, uh, the Middle East, uh, North America and Asia. So uh, we, we will try and be mindful, myself and my uh, guest, uh, Philip Dallal, who I'll introduce to you in a moment, uh, mindful that uh, different parts of the world, uh, there are slightly different uh, jargon and also um, ways of doing things. But we'll try and be mindful of that as we talk through. So my name is Rob Goddard and I own four businesses. I'm a non-exec director and board advisor on another five, and I work for two charities, one in the UK, a cancer charity, and also an orphanage in Albania, in Europe. So uh, I, I'm supposed to be retired, but I'm as busy as I was when I had a full-time job working for one company. So that's myself. My, my main line of work is helping business owners prepare um, for an eventual exit. And I'd like to introduce to you my friend and uh, colleague and uh, partner, actually, in terms of we've done quite a few of these events together, albeit live rather than online. And uh, Philip Delisle has started quite a few businesses. He's grown a number of businesses. He's exited a number of business and he's invested in oodles of companies over the years. But I let him... Uh, tell you about himself in, in, in a moment. I see the numbers are, uh, are going up. That's great. Um, I have to say with Philip, he, he is the person you do not want to be the other side of a negotiating table. <laughs> I've known this from Philip. Philip has mentored me for five years. He always asks the difficult question. <laughs> the question you don't want to be asked, but you know is in the back of your mind. So our time uh, today really is for uh, you to gain knowledge and insight and information and some tips from a poacher turned gamekeeper. He's on our side for our next hour and a half. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass you over to Philip Delal to introduce himself and then I'll go through some questions about raising investment and getting yourself investment ready. Okay, Philip, uh, tell us who you are and, and, and uh, what you do in life. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for asking me to do this. Um, right, well, a very quick race through my career. Um, I was actually going to be an academic uh, and uh, was offered tenure at a leading UK university uh, in industrial relations. Uh, but then my professor, who was also my mentor, decided to retire and I watched the department destroy itself and decided that that wasn't for me. So I went into business. Uh, uh, no history of business in my family. I come from a very, very long line, centuries long line of soldiers, professional soldiers. Uh, but that was a career I didn't fancy. Um, started off as so many young men do in the car trade as I had a love of cars. Uh, went through lots of different types of industries. So uh, PR and advertising, travel, uh, software, and ended up in telecoms. Uh, grew my last business and exited my last business at one5 uh, billion dollar valuation, um, put the team together that uh, invented the free internet in the mid 90s. Um, and it's a business that nobody had ever heard of because we also invented the concept of white labeling for telecoms. Um, so since about 2002, when I got very bored playing golf and my handicap didn't change, um, people started to ask me if I would look over their businesses and help them. So uh, for quite a long time, I had a career as a non-exec chair. I've been non-exec chair of private companies and of VC and private equity backed businesses. Uh, but really decided to focus on my passion, which was, was working on businesses through people. And, and this mentoring career really found me. Um, it's how Rob and I met five or so years ago. Uh, and we've, as Rob said, we've been working together as colleagues um, and have become very close friends in the process, which has been a, an added bonus. So that's a little bit about me. As Rob said, the whole purpose of this is to try and give you some, uh, some understanding of how the investment process can work. Um, what I'm going to talk about today when prompted by Rob, um, it's not 
foolproof. It's not like a manual. They're really observations about what can happen. There are some certain things that I will, will sort of urge upon you to consider, but it's really about my sort of experience of, of preparing for investment when I was on the other side of the table and what I'm looking for as an investor. Uh, so I'll hand it back to you, Rob, to lead off. Yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I, I will say that if you have a burning question, um, just pop it into the Q&A box on the Zoom call and I will facilitate those questions. So Philip and I very much want this to, ha uh, not, it's not a presentation, it's a chat. And so uh, Philip and I are going to have a conversation between us. I will monitor the questions that will come in and, uh, and facilitate that part. Um, so I think, uh, like you, Philip, I, I, I get approached, particularly on LinkedIn, by people who have a great idea but no money. And one of the things they want to know is uh, sources of investment. So perhaps you can talk us through where someone might look for uh, people that would perhaps back an idea or back a company or provide some investment funding. Well, one of the obvious places to start for investment is the one that people tend to shy away from, um, and that's your bank. Um, there are obviously, it's expensive to go to your bank, and they'll probably want you to put your house up as collateral. But the one advantage of going to your bank is that you'll retain 100% ownership of your business. Every other type of investment means that you are going to be diluted. Um, and having external investors in your business can present a whole series of problems and challenges that you might not have thought about or experienced in, 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 uh, previous, uh, in previous life. Um, so running down sort of through a list of uh, investment, investments um, which will increase your dilution. So each one of these is a little bit more dilution than the one before. So your bank is zero. The next one is crowdfunding, and, and you can see quite a lot of adverts on the TV at the moment for various crowdfunders. Um, then you've got angels. Uh, angels are a very popular route for investors. They're individuals like myself, like Rob, who have, have either exited businesses or have, uh, are independently wealthy and are looking to use the tax advantages of ISA and things like that to invest in other businesses. Um, then you've got venture capital, uh, who buy a percentage of your business and quite a large percentage. Then you've got private equity who will buy more than 50%. The, the purpose of private equity is to be the eventual owner. You'll have a very small slice of that. Um, and then the final one is IPO when, when everybody plus their dog um, owns your business. IPO, in, uh, initial public offering. So a public listing on the London Stock Exchange or one of the major bourses around the world. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way of, of going about it. I, I would be very... If you're looking for investment, think very carefully about how much control you want to give up because the point about the dilution is you're going to end up losing control as well. You've got to think about other your investors' needs as much as your own. Uh, and when I say your own, I don't mean you as an individual. I mean you as, an, as a business. Um, investors are, don't always... Are there any... I'm they, just sort of... Pre Sorry, Rob, go ahead. I was going to say, Philip, are there any of that list, are any of that list of funding sources easier to get investment from than others in your experience? Uh, well, I think it, yeah, I think the fact that you are, you are giving away more and more dilution as you go through the list, the more dilution you give away, the harder the process becomes. Um, because, you know, you get to private equity and they're going to rip your company apart in terms of due diligence so that they know exactly what it is that they're putting, you know, what they are buying, because they're effectively buying your business. Um, but you go to your bank, they'll just want a set of accounts, which they'll have almost certainly anyway, um, if they're doing their job properly. So they'll have three-year sets of accounts. They'll be looking for a three-year business plan. It'll go up to their funding committee, or, uh, assuming that you want more than the local manager or the area manager can, can sign off. Um, they won't ask for a huge amount of data. But as you go down that list, you know, angels are going to want to do due diligence. VC, private equity, they're all going to want to do due diligence in varying degrees. So how, how does someone know, someone that's listening to this today, how do they know whether they are investment ready or whether they've got some work to do? How can they establish that, identify that? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so 
I think the biggest thing to, to that there's a couple of of not quite rules, but things you need to really consider about getting investment ready. The first thing is what's your unique selling point, your USP? Um, it never ceases to amaze me when I talk to businesses um, that actually they're not at all sure of what their USP is. As an investor, it's really important to me that you have a unique selling proposition. Um, then I wanna know if your marketplace is growing. If your marketplace is shrinking, that might be a negative not necessarily because if you're going to use that in my investment to go and buy other companies in your marketplace for consolidation that can be a good thing um, then i'd ask you how messy is your business what do i mean by that um what are the risks to the business um what it what is it that you're not happy about telling me in case i run a mile uh, and then we come down to your team how strong is your team uh, if you're a one-man band or if you are the, the, the driving force behind your business, that represents a risk to me. If you've got a solid team behind you, that is much less of a risk. Uh, then I want to know what your plan is for the next three years uh, once I've given you the money. In fact, do you even have a plan? I'm amazed how many businesses operate without. Um, it's really important that that plan is credible too from my point of view. Then I need you to think about how much money do you really need? Uh, I see too many um, invitations to invest where the amount of money that they want, it's, it's blatantly obvious to me that, that either they've gone way over the top or they've not asked for enough. And one of the things that is, it should really concern everybody is, is the situation we find ourselves in today with COVID. One of the key questions for me as an investor is what happens to this business after I've invested if there is an unforeseen uh, element an unforeseen circumstance like covid like brexit um, and then the key question for you and the, this is the really key question for you if you're looking for an investor is how do you feel about having a third party somebody like me looking over your shoulder you can no longer run it as a fiefdom you've got to think about the external investment uh, and where you uh, where you're going to give me the return on investment that i'm looking for it, I, I can, it's an absolute joy having you leaning over my shoulder, asking me difficult questions. That's not what you say when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I often say, just tell me the answer. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work like that though, Rob, does it? If I tell you the answer, how much do you learn? If you figure it out for yourself, you'd never forget. It's called fast track learning. <laughs> <laughs> so... <clears throat> So and that, what about someone though? I, I don't know about you, but I get approached quite a lot by people who don't, who haven't sold their product or service that they've invented. So it's pre-revenue. Oh, pre-revenue. There no, so there's no accounts. Um, <laughs> it's 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 an idea, and it may be on a. They may maybe a slide deck. There may be some plans going forward. Might be. Um, Presumably that's more, that's more tricky or harder to get investment if you actually haven't got a business, but you've got a great idea. I think the true answer to that is, yeah, it is. I mean, if you come to somebody like me, um, it's a difficult one because if the idea is a really good one um, and, and you know, as an investor, you know it's, if it's a really good idea because you're, you're, you, you mentally go, cool, why has nobody thought of this before? Um, and sophisticated investors, and if you go back to the list I gave you earlier, so I'm going into sort of the, the private equity, you know, the VCs and the private equity, they've got research teams. And so with those research teams, if they think it's a good idea, they will pull in experts that they know or they'll find experts um, very often through the university space and they'll run the idea past them. Now, of course, key thing from your point of view, if you are that person with the invention or the idea, for goodness sake, make sure you've got a watertight NDA. That's absolutely critical because otherwise that IP is going to go walkabouts and you'll lose. Um, but it is very, very difficult. I think if you've got an idea like that, part of the, to get investment, you need to really prove that the idea works. You don't necessarily have to make money, but you need to prove that the idea works. And the key thing about that, I would always argue is, have you got a customer? If you can go into the marketplace and get a customer for your idea, they don't have to pay for it. They just need to say as a commitment, 
I will. You, you produce this, I'll buy it. Um, if you've got that, then you stand a chance of getting investment. But I would be looking, I think, to your, low, to your own personal network. So family and friends um, and possibly the bank. If it is that good an idea and you believe in it passionately, then you will believe enough in it to put your house on the line. I mean, putting a house on the line is a big step. It's a big commitment. But if you believe in it passionately, and as an investor, I'm looking for that kind of belief. Um, if you come to me and you haven't done these sorts of things, and if you haven't had a conversation with the bank to put your house on the line, I'm less likely to back it. If you say, well, I've, you know, I've put my house up for this. I mean, I've, I'm literally, this is, this is everything I've got in this idea. Then that tells me that I've got your undivided attention and your full commitment. So it's possible I would invest in it, but um, I would okay. certainly want it sanity checked by somebody other than myself. You know, if my antenna twitch, cause I think it's a good idea, that's the first step, but there's a big difference. I mean, we, we, we all know, you know, most investment houses, venture capital and PE, they, they talk about their successes. They don't talk about the 25 plus that aren't making money. It's, it's not, if it was a science, everybody would be doing it. And it's not, there's a large element of, of, of luck in this. So I, I, I got our first question, Philip, that's just popped up. Um, it's an interesting one. So you, um, if you, you personally were looking for an investment for one of your businesses today, um, what would you do? And where would you where would you go for? Where would you home in to get the investment and the backing that you were looking for right now? Oh, that is a good question. Um, it is a really good question. It is a good question. I, I think I think from my point of view, I think I'm going to have to answer. I'm going to have to chunk that slightly because it really rather depends on how far along the business is. The more mature a business and assuming that I'm. You know, I, I'm, I'm a, as, as you know, I'm a great believer in growing businesses and I'm not a complete finisher. So I've always sold my businesses before they would reached them, their peak, as it were, um, because I'm not a complete finisher. So, um, but assuming, depending upon how long the maturity road they are, that really in my head determines where you go to look for investment. Um, if, it's, if it's a startup, uh, and again, you see, we're back into what sector. If it's a technology company, much easier to get money for. Um, if it's something like particularly, you know, certain sectors, you know, if it's pharmaceuticals with COVID, for example, if you've got something in the COVID space, you're likely to get more money, you know, be beating investors off with a stick. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's technology, it stands a better chance of getting um investment from the comp from the from the sectors lower down the list i gave earlier if it's not and it's not that mature then you're probably looking at the sort of bank crowdfunding stroke angel route there's no one size fits all to that's a great question but there's no one mm. size fits all answer i'm afraid i just from personal experience i get two or three pitches a week via linkedin usually um and they're normally pre-revenue, so they actually haven't got a, a working trading business. And so my response is always the same. I always respond to people if they've taken the time to contact me and reach out. Um, I'd say that I don't normally invest in startups unless I'm in control. Mm. And, no, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> and it's very frustrating, I think, for, for, for people, you know, particularly angels, who probably have run their own businesses, it, it can be... And it's one of the reasons why, why you need to think very much whether, whether having an investor is right for you. Um, people who are used to running their own yeah. businesses find it very difficult to sit on their hands. They want to get involved. They want to, they want to drive it forward because they've got a vested interest in doing so. Yeah, I mean, one tip. When I started my first business, I got um, 14 people um, to, to invest in me privately. And they're all people that were in the same sector as me when I had a job in the, in the sector. So they knew of me and my capabilities, but I, you know, um, so it, it's easier if people with pre-revenue, if, if people are aware of you and what you've done in the past and your skills and, and what you've achieved, 
um, that's an easier pitch for a pre-revenue. Mm. So maybe if you're looking, if you're in that situation, maybe people who know you in business already. I think well, as it comes back to what I said earlier. I think, you know, you need to be looking at your own network. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, also, know you and trust you. yeah. And also too, the point that you made about you, you you've got investment from people who knew you. Um, I don't know whether that business was in the same sector that they were in, but if it was, they become the experts that I was referring to later, that the, uh, earlier rather, that the VCs and the private equity boys would go and talk to. Um, it is that expertise, yeah. it's that knowledge of the space that you want to operate in that will... will... Yeah. See, the thing about investment, yeah. what's, what's the key thing about investment? The thing about investment is return on investment, and, and, if, and that is, is the return on risk investing is a risk and anything that increases that risk makes you less likely to get investment anything that decreases that risk will make it easier to get investment and having third parties um pass the slide rule over you and give you a tick in, in to an investor that's a way of okay well lots of experts have looked at that and said that it's it's viable so that's probably less risky than yeah. something that hasn't had that that uh, slide rule run over it so using your local network, and the great thing about your local network, because they know you, they'll give you an honest answer. If they don't think yeah. it'll fly, they will tell you. Um, whereas yeah. experts will couch it in different ways, you know, when would I hurt your feelings and what have you. Your friends and family will tell you as it is. My wife, I mean, any yeah. idea that I've had in the last 20 odd years, 30 odd years, I've run past my wife. Well, wow. she gives me it in both barrels. Um, and she's perfect. She's the perfect foil for that. Um, and if it gets past her, then it goes out to other tr people that I trust who I know will give me an honest answer, like you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> another question that come in is, uh, how easy is it to find angels and get in front of dragons? Um, uh, it's an interesting one. It's really difficult to get in front of the dragons. In, in the UK, we have a program called Dragon's Den. I know that America have something similar um over there where people are pitching on a tv program for investment um i'm i'm connected with 17 uh bbc dragons <laughs> uh past and uh, uh past and uh, present as well um they're hard to get hold of they're busy people because they're worth 100 million 200 million 300 million dollars it's really hard to get through to them direct um, so it is better what, what you've suggested, Philip, deal with your immediate network. I mean, you can go to family. That's one of the other questions. Oh yeah. Shark Tank is the American one. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that prompt. We have Dragon's Den. America has Shark Tank. Uh, um, the, the problem with family, of course, is your family and, and blood's thicker than water. And if you're taking uh, an investment from a family member, it comes with all sorts of uh, considerations, doesn't it, Philip? It does indeed. Yeah, family businesses. <laughs> family businesses can be a challenge uh, in all sorts of different ways. Um, there's a, I think, guilt tripping is probably the phrase I would use if, with right. if you're getting investment from family members. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, think very carefully about that. Yeah. But coming back to the earlier to, to, to the question that came in there, Rob. I mean, you, you've talked about the, the the big dragons, the real big beasts, who nearly all of them yeah. have investment vehicles, investment companies, and therefore they'll have a lot of gatekeepers for you to go through before you get anywhere near them. But there are an awful lot of small angel networks. Uh, around certainly in yep. the UK, certainly in North America, um, and I suspect in most countries of the world, there will be rich individuals who have sold a business and 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 want to and, and want to invest in others. Um, and I, I mean, in that instance, I'd say your search engine is probably your best bet, and just put in whatever country yeah, you're in, yeah. just put an angel network in and see what comes up. But in the UK, yeah, there what... are literally hundreds of angel networks. Well, one, one that you and I know, because we know the owner of this company is Angel's Den, yeah. Bill Morrow. Yeah. And if yeah. Bill happens to see this, hello, Bill. Um, and uh, in fact, they're the largest angel network. They're based in the UK, but they're all over the world, yes. including the Middle East, in yes. Dubai, I know um, um, precisely. But Angel's Den don't deal, um, uh, unless it's changed, they won't look at um, startups and pre-revenue. 
So it's existing businesses with a bit of a track record. Yeah. But so when you're looking for investment you, you, um, and you're doing the Google search, which I think is a good idea, see what comes up with those keyword searches. Um, some investors specialize in certain parts of the, the growth story. So it's some um, will only uh, some will look at pre-revenue and startups. Others will want more mature business or uh, growth businesses, and others will want to come in at the later stage. So you need to find out very quickly, perhaps from their website, what they would look at and what they wouldn't look at, and also industry. Um, a, a lot of angels only invest in what they know. Yeah, and and that's where they can give most value, isn't it, Philip? It is you indeed. Know, um, from past it is indeed. I mean, most angels. Yeah. Most angels will expect to get a seat on the board. They'll expect to 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 help yeah. you drive it forward. Um, in fact, I, I, yeah. it's quite unusual for them so, not to. So let, let's talk about growth because whenever I see an investment pitch deck, um, it's it the growth is this. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's <laughs> uh, that's from startup. <laughs> my, my, it could almost be vertical. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't believe it. I don't believe it. <laughs> Let's just have a cup of coffee. Cool the whole thing off. Yeah. Um, and, and the other one we tend to see with existing businesses, hockey stick growth curve. So it, it, it's kind of, it, it, it's a small incline. And then as soon as they get the investment, whoosh, whoosh. they go stratospheric. <laughs> yeah. Hockey stick growth curve. Um, oh, whoosh. I wish. You taught me something years ago that business business growth isn't linear. So perhaps no, you it's could not. sort of expand on that. No, it's like the Russian steps. Um, the, all businesses will plateau um, at some point, and businesses that go on for a long um, and sorry, stop and come back. Um, most businesses, certainly when they start up and they hit their first plateau. Um, Unfortunately, most of them then decline. Um, and you have to ask, why is that? And the reason, I think, is because when you start a business, you tend to hire, your first few hires tend to be friends, friends and family. Um, and that's a good thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it's people that you trust. The key thing is people having people around you that you trust. Um, and also, they build a culture. Um, that that is a mirror of you because they're your friends and culture is is something that I don't think many businesses truly understand if truth be told and how important it is in how to grow a business and the problem is you then you then do reach a plateau so you'll get your you'll, you'll you'll probably have two or three good years because it's new it's easier to sell because it's new so you've got it's virgin territory um, and then you plateau and the the really good business owners question why it plateaus. And if they're honest, the reason why it plateaus is because they've exhausted the capabilities of the people that they've hired. So you know, if you hire a friend who's not, not an accountant, but you've hired them to do your books and your business grows and you've, you've, you know, you're no longer doing your accounts on a spreadsheet, but you're now using one of the proprietary packages and actually you started with the smallest package, but now you've outgrown that and you need the bigger package. Now you need to actually think about getting a proper accountant on board um, because you're obviously going places and, and your friend who you hired hasn't got that capability because they're not trained. So most businesses, if not all of them, plateau because you've exhausted the capability of the team. The really good businesses and the ones that really do make it, um, the owners realize that and start hiring new people. So who do they hire? Well, if they're wise, hire people from businesses in the similar sector or with transferable skills from companies that have reached the next level. So they've plateaued. And the reason why you want to hire those is because those individuals know how to bridge that particular gap. They know how to get up that side of the hill. And then you'll, you'll, burn, you'll, you'll exhaust their capabilities, then go look again. And that's how businesses become really consolidated and really can grow very, very well. But finding those members of the team, really important. One of the things an investor, I'm actually looking very much at your team um, because I'm going to work on the basis being what happens if you get hit by the proverbial number nine bus 
if you're not in the business anymore, if all of the ideas, if all of the execution is, is bound up in you, that's a big risk for me. Whereas if you've got a capable team, and more importantly, you let the team do their jobs, you don't try and micromanage, then uh, that's a much more investable vehicle from my point of view. It's much less risky from my point of view. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. No, th we've, we've had a question in from John. Um, is it in and around these sort of startup? Um, it's, it's an interesting one. I've got a view, but I'll let you go first on this. Um, the question from John is, if you are thinking of starting up a new business, what defining characteristics would you look for in co-founders? I'm sorry, you broke up in what, in what was the last bit? What would I look for in what? Oh, okay. What defining characteristics would you look for in co-founders that are joining you? Oh, <laughs> oh that is a good question. Um, you, go, you go first. <laughs> well, for, for, for me, well, for, for me, it's really important. I, I, I came up with a model 15 odd years ago about how to hire and, and what to look for when you're hiring. So, um, uh, it, and it's a, it's a, a mix of competence and capability and fit and culture. Um, and for me, fit and culture trumps competence unless it's time critical. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, if somebody, if, and this applies, doesn't matter whether you're in a startup mode, this applies at any point where you're hiring um, in your business. Um, you cannot teach culture, but you can teach competence and capability. So if you have time, um, fit and culture always trumps competence. If you don't have time, then err towards competence. But if you get the fit wrong, if you get the culture and the fit wrong, it doesn't matter how competent they are, that person or people, they're going to be grit in the gearbox. They're actually, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get what you need in the short term, but you won't get what you need in the long term. That's well, my the, the answer, question anyway. from John is specifically around co-founders. Co so quite well, it's often co-founders It has, it has to be fit together. because it ha for me, it yeah. has to be but fit. They, they and and it goes together. to what I said to earlier, you're hiring your friends. You tend to hire your friends um, and, and they may yeah. not have the skills necessary, but they're quite happy to roll their sleeves up and muck in and learn how to be competent at what needs to be done. Uh, but fit is, to me, yeah. fit's crucial. Yeah, and, and, and something we've talked about before is roles and responsibilities, isn't it? Where yeah. Usually in the context within sort of people working in the business. I, I, I mean, uh, answer, uh, me answering the question from a slightly different angle, I've got to like them. If I don't like them, I won't go into business with them, full stop. I don't care what their uh, technical skills. So it does link in with what you've just said there, yeah, Philip. very much. Um, this has got to be fun, right? There's no point going into business with people if it's going to be heartache, stress and anxiety. So um, that's, that's a prerequisite. Uh, the, other, the second thing is roles and responsibilities. Is, is the co-founder and fellow investor, are they passive or active? Mm. Uh, if they're passive, they've got to stay passive. They're, they're investors. They're not part of the board. They're not, um, uh, they're not executives. So you, you've got to clearly define what the role of uh, each of you as founders are. And if you're all working in the business, then you've got to have clearly defined role, uh, uh, roles. Yeah, yeah. roles. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, it'll be the first source of that grit in the shoe, won't it? Because hmm. you, won't, you won't be getting, it won't be fun. It'll be an irritation that you're stepping on each other's toes. So you, you've got to be clearly defined about what you're going to do within the business. I think actually too. And also that does, that does link with how much money they're putting in. Because if you're, <clears throat> I, I usually if, if someone is, is going to work a lot, if they're going to have an executive role and they're going to have a full-time role within the business, that's one thing. Um, if it's a passive investor, my argument is they should have less of an equity stake. I wouldn't disagree with that. 
Um, okay. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. But one of the things I, I just wanted to pick up on, because uh, what you were saying triggered a, triggered a thought in my head. One, and, and this is true right the way across the investment piece. Um, the key determinant for whether you accept investment as, as the business owner or whether I, as the investor, make that investment in you is trust. And if you don't trust that person, you might like them, but you don't trust them. If you don't trust them, don't have them anywhere near your business. If I don't trust you, if when you're pitching to me, if I don't trust what I'm hearing, or I think there's a hidden agenda or anything like that, you'll never get my money. Never in a million years will I give you money. Yeah. I have to trust yeah. you because you're looking after my money. You're, you're, the reason why I'm investing in you is because I want a return. I'm looking for you to grow my money. And to do that, I have to trust you. Likewise, you have to trust as the business owner, you have to trust me as the investor that I'm actually not there to rip you off. So again, that comes back to the culture bit. One of the things in the fit and the culture, a, a huge element of that is trust. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, the, there's a couple of questions that have popped into the, uh, the box there um, about outsource teams. So it, going back to, you know, in terms of the, the right fit, I, I would say that would be true, not only true of co-founders, staff that you take on, but also the people that you contract work out to. Oh, absolutely. They've all got to fit within that culture, haven't they, Philip? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and when, you, when you outsource to anybody, the, the key decision that you'll be making, even if you don't realise it, and the key question that internally you'll be asking, even if you don't realise it, is do I trust them? Uh, and yeah, you're yeah, paying, yeah. you know, if you're and, outsourcing, and, you're paying these people, so you better trust them. Exactly. Um, uh, there is a question, uh, is co-founding 50-50? Well, no, not, not if there's three of them. <laughs> you <won't get> <laughs> and, and also, um, co doesn't mean equal either. I mean, it's, it's you know, you exactly. can have a co-founder who only actually, you know, you know is, is putting up 15% of the money, so they only get 15% of the equity or whatever the numbers happen to be. But there's no way that it, a co-founder with two people has to be a 50-50 split. Here's a couple of things I've noticed. I've got an example. A few years ago, a company where there were two shareholders, um, a 10% shareholder and a 90% shareholder. The 90% shareholder didn't do anything in the business. He just started it originally. The 10% 10, 10 shareholder did everything as MD. And um, it, it was difficult for the MD and 10% shareholder to get anything done. Yeah. Because it would always be could always be vetoed and yeah. I, I i i remember speaking to both of them um at length a few times coaching them and said you've really got to get this sorted because the person doing all the work just has a minority stake and that will give you a problem anyway they, they subsequently ignored my advice and carried on as normal <laughs> um and then a few years later i found out that 90 percent shareholder died in a motorcycle accident oh and now the MD who's got a 10% stake is having to deal with executives Family. of the estate. Yeah. 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 It, it, you know what? It's, 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 it's so getting, I, I was told by a, a friend of mine, John, that when you set up a business together, plan for divorce. Oh, always. So have it, have it in writing, the what ifs, a proper shareholders agreement that covers oh. the ins and outs, yeah. if you fall out, if, yeah. something, if something happens. No, uh, the, the shareholders agreement, with I, that I mean, it, on the dude, I mean, one of the things we, we may talk about later, but, but one of the key things about whether you're selling a business or you're getting investment is, is you're going to have to go through the due diligence process. And the number one item on the due diligence list is please can i see the shareholders agreement um because the last thing yeah. particularly you know the, the the bit that that sellers and investees don't sometimes appreciate is actually how expensive it is to do the due diligence from the investor or the buyer's point of view um it might not be monetary it could just be time but nevertheless there is a there is an, a cost element to doing it and if you haven't got a a shareholders agreement for, you know, that, that I'll walk away from that. It doesn't matter whether I'm buying you or investing in you, no shareholders agreement, no deal. 
um, because I have no idea what could come out of the woodwork. Um, I had, a, uh, you know, uh, literally at the point of signing, I had, a, uh, I had a client. Fortunately, I wasn't doing the investment. I was actually mentoring them um, at, through a sale. And literally a week before the sale was due to complete, um, a family member came out of the woodwork and said, hang on a minute, I'm a shareholder in this. I, I want to have a say. And we didn't know anything about it. Um, so absolutely critical that you have a shareholders agreement and get it at the beginning before people get greedy. One of the things that tends yeah. to happen is that, that you might have somebody who's quite important to the business and, and has a small shareholding, but because they recognize their importance, they then hold you hostage. So get the yeah. shareholders agreement done. If you're starting a business, get it done right in the very beginning. So I would add two because I've, I've come across this situation probably like you, uh, definitely shareholders agreement, a will, a key man insurance when you're pitching for investment because you may be, if you're looking for investment from a stranger and you keel over or become seriously ill, that might be the business gone. Yeah. So think yeah. about it from the investor's point of view, not from yours. So those are the you three must things. Walk. Um, you must walk place. in the investment. I mean, if you think about it, when you sell a business or whether you're looking for investment, you are actually selling. You're selling the future. Yes. But because you're selling, first rule of selling, any, anybody who's watching this who's in, in sales will tell you this, you've got to walk a mile in the other person's moccasins. You've got to walk a mile in their moccasins because you've got to understand or try and understand what they're thinking and how they're feeling. So you have to think about, well, what would, what would I you know, think about? What would I as an investor be looking for in your business? Um, and, and there's a lot of elements to that uh, in investment too. People don't think deeply enough about what they're selling. For example, a really well, stupid example, if you've got premises, who owns the premises? Is it owned by the business or is it in your personal pension plan? If it's in your personal pension plan, not wonderful from my point of view as an investor, not the end of the world, but I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to be told up front before I get into the due diligence because it is a factor in my decision-making process. How much stock do you have? You, Rob, tell well, a lovely story about a client you had that, that had no idea what their stock levels were. They literally would go into the fact, onto the factory floor and pull the bins out and see how many nuts and bolts there were. Oh, well, we're getting a bit low. We'll order some more. That's no good to me as an investor. They, they only had an 8,000 product range. 8,000 products. Yeah. <laughs> all in big bins. That's no good to me. <laughs> I, at all. Well, that leads in very deep. Well, a question that's just popped up is how, how do I get investment ready? I think probably the quick answer I'll give, uh, Philip can't say this, but I can. Uh, get Philip into your business, right? <laughs> Let him have a look and ask you, the, ask you all sorts of questions. Parachute uh, Philip in um, to do an analysis and a review. And he will soon tell you what's good about the business in terms of um, strengths and robustness for an investment pitch and where you might get outflanked by an investor or investors. It's worth the time and money. Uh, Philip's reassuringly expensive. <laughs> so I, I, want, I want to link three things together, which is the business plan, lifting up the drains and the pitch because they're interrelated. So are, are business plans worth the paper they're written on? when you receive them, Philip? Uh, rarely, I think, is the answer I would, I would uh, say about that. Um, and understandably so in, to a point in that um, if you're looking for investment, you want to paint your business in the best possible light. And you want to show that the business with the investment is going to take off and go to great heights. The problem with that, if you, if you over gild the lily, is that, that I'm just not going to believe it. Do you remember I said the key thing about this is trust? Well, part of that trust comes about from the information that you give me. If you give me a business plan that I don't believe, then th that trust has gone before we even start. Um, so I think if you're going to put a business plan together, put a business plan together with different scenarios. So play what ifs. If this happens, we would expect to get to here. If that happens, we expect to get to here. And if that happens, we expect to get to here. But don't just go in and go, well, we'll be, I mean, the one thing that, that, that every investor will tell you, they, they annoys them intensely, 
is when they see a business plan that says we will exit in five years time for x hundred million because my first response is how on earth did you get to that figure and how do you know that's going to happen there has to be realism in a business plan has to be realism in a business plan because that's the document that i'm going to hold you accountable to yeah and as the investor i'm not a good good bedfellow to have um, so you're going to have to think very carefully about how you how you approach your business plan to attract me in don't don't over gild it yeah so you need to be positive and say the right things but it needs to have some degree of realism and it's don't gotta be realistic it's got to be realistic yeah, yeah. and and yeah. you know to be fair the thing is that you're selling you're selling the future now i don't know about you but my crystal balls ain't that good and you know who foresaw covid uh, so you you it can be very difficult to to um, to to be realistic but if you were to do worst case scenarios particularly if you were to to document worst case scenarios that at least shows me that you've thought about it uh, you know you have tried to be realistic yeah. and again that that says to me that actually you're probably you know on the trust you're building up levels of trust that'll take you to the next level in my eyes yeah because one of the things they're buying an investor is you isn't it as the person leading the business oh absolutely and so you've got yeah. to have authenticity about you yeah and the key thing to bear be in mind with that too is that people don't people don't buy what you do they buy what you believe in and that again comes back to the to the cultural fit and the trust. If I don't believe in what you're talking about, then it's just not going to happen. I'm not going to give you any money. So you, you and and realistic okay. business plans or unrealistic business plans, I should say, that will kill that stone dead. I'm going to ask you to sort of give a couple of your trade secrets away, if I may, Philip. Um, about lifting up the drains. I, I don't know how well that uh, expression translates into other countries and other parts of the world, but yeah. how, how do you find out the truth yeah, about the business? Right. That, right. What, what, what are the questions? What I'm, let me explain what I mean by lifting are. the drains, because it's a phrase I use right. quite a lot. Um, and this is all about due diligence. Uh, when uh, the, the process of due diligence is when an investor or a buyer gets access to your books, your contracts, um, basically everything about your business before they determine whether or not they're going to buy or invest. So it applies to both sides of this. Um, and it's every business, every business has got nasties lurking somewhere that you don't want to talk about at dinner parties. Uh, anybody who tells me that they don't, I'm afraid I don't believe. Um, and the key thing about, about lifting the drains is to do your own due diligence on your own business. Look at your own business as if you were going to be buying it or investing in it and figure out what it is that needs to be fixed. Now, for a, if you're selling your business, I know we're, this was supposed to be about investment, but it's applicable. If you're selling your business, don't fix everything. When I'm working with business owners to prepare their businesses for sale, I specifically say, don't fix that. That's a quick win for the buyer. They like that. That actually makes them feel good about the business. If you've got, and, and Rob, I'm sure you can attest to this. I've actually known businesses that became very difficult to sell because they were too perfect. The buyer couldn't see how they were going to be able to add value to that business and therefore increase their own wealth. And that's almost an oxymoron. You know, people get, find it quite difficult to get their heads around that. But a business can be too perfect, which makes it less attractive to buy. So as a buyer, as a seller rather, don't fix everything. Fix the really dangerous things, the things that could destabilize the business, but leave some quick wins for the buyers. That's not the same for investment. For investment, fix everything that you can. And if you can't fix it, know how to fix it because very often you can say to an investor this needs fixing it's really crucial to the next stage of our growth but we haven't got the money to do it and that's one of the reasons why we want your investment we're going to use that to fix this that automatically gets us up that you know up the russian step the next hill 
Uh, and an investor will, will yeah. accept that. They will go for that because again, an investor knows that you've really analyzed your business. And again, that, that's adding to the trust quotient. Um, yeah. So do be aware of what you need to fix, but do your own due diligence on your own business and do it before you want the money, as it were. Don't, don't do it while you're asking for the money. Do it before, because particularly as an investor, I'll tell you here and now, I'm going to ask you questions you've not thought about. So the more due diligence that you've done into your own business, the better prepared you're going to be to answer that question. And an acceptable answer is, I don't know the answer to that yet. I'll get back to you tomorrow. If you've done the due diligence, you'll know where to look. If you haven't done the due diligence, you could be floundering around for ages. So it's, it's part of some of those questions. Do they come, some of them come from researching social media presence, customer feedback and reputation. Do, do you delve into that as well, Philip, when you're looking at a, an investment? I do when I get to the due diligence stage. Um, in the early stages, it's more about uh, about the trust quotient. Uh, it, it's a, it comes back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, people buy people. People don't buy what you do. They buy what you believe. So for me, it's about do I like the person? Do I trust them? Would I invite them to dinner? Um, you know, do I want to go down the pub and have a natter with them? And if I do, and they've got a proposition then that I like, then when the, when the proper due diligence comes, all that social media stuff, the LinkedIn profiles, Facebook going back however many years, yeah, we'll look at all of that. We will look at all of that. Um, and I'm going to give, a, if I may, I want to give you a, a slightly weird example, but it happened very recently um, and why it's important. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the co-op um, got, got trolled by uh, online um, with a spectator. The spectator magazine, uh, they, they are politically agnostic, um, but a troll decided they didn't like one of the articles that they'd written, got hold of the uh, co-op who was a big investor, sorry, a big advertiser, and basically um, put pressure on the social media team to drop the advertising. The social media team, because they're part of customer services, wanted to keep the company happy, basically said, yeah, we agree, we won't advertise them anymore. Now, they made, they made a commitment that the board of the co-op knew nothing about. So they committed the co-op to not advertising in the Spectator magazine. Spectator magazine, <laughs> fascinating, uh, turned around and said, we will never take advertising from the co-op ever again, even if they apologize. And the Spectator's readership went through the roof the number of people on Twitter, very well-known people on Twitter in the UK, who said they would never buy anything from the co-op again, was huge. They got yeah. clobbered by wokeness. So uh, the reason why I'm raising that is that's why social media, because the internet never dies. Anything on the internet is there forever. It never dies. So as a consequence, you need to be very careful about what you say now, because it could come back and bite you in the future, because we will find it. Yeah, it's not only what you say, it's what you do, because I can re remember, this is going back quite a few years, um, someone looking to sell their business, we found out that he had a criminal record. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he spent six months in jail yeah. um, for, for stalking a lady. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, some people do have a colourful past, and you are right, um, the internet never forgets. And so um, I, one tip I would give, if, if you've had, we often have, a, many people have a colourful past, make sure you disclose, maybe not a criminal, <laughs> maybe that you haven't been in prison, as an extreme example, but maybe some stuff has gone wrong in life, and uh, maybe you disclose that at the appropriate juncture when you're getting to know a potential investor, so that it's not a surprise later on. So maybe you take the initiative. Oh, and absolutely. Just position whatever that situation is. But, but again, think, you know, if you take the initiative and put, put, for want of a better term, your, your dirty washing on the table in front of me, what does that say to me as a potential investor or as a buyer? You're trying to build trust. If you try and hide it yeah. and I find it, you, there is no trust. That's gone. Yeah, I, I just developing that idea. What one tip I reg, regularly have given to people over the last twenty years of selling businesses is before we go into a meeting to sell their business or an investment pitch, say to them, "Look, 
maybe just take a humble position um, because some business owners, I, 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 know, I know you'll smile at this, uh, like being the centre of attention. Um, you think? <laughs> like, al alpha individuals <laughs> like to control, <laughs> like to be the big I am and a legend in their own lunchtime. Uh, I'm sure no one listening to this podcast uh, that applies to at all. Oh, that was uh, me. But there are some people out there. That was me. I'll hold my hand up. <laughs> but that I, was me. When you're, when you're looking for investment, or indeed if you're looking to sell your company, is say, look, um, we may be doing some things wrong, and, and, and we haven't got around to doing some other things, but we are making a million dollars bottom line profit. So think with your involvement and your investment, how much better the business could be. So it's, it's, a, it's a different psychology, isn't it? Rather than thinking in a pitch that you have to be the, the be all and end all is actually, you know, be proud of what you've achieved uh, as a team of people, but also accept where there are deficiencies and go on the front foot and say, you know, with, with your help and involvement, I'm sure you can take us on to bigger and better things. Yeah, absolutely. Good psychology. Absolutely. So, um, about negotiation, because once you've got in the room with uh, an angel or private equity, or you <laughs> as, a, as a private investor, um, how does that dynamic, what, what tips would you give people if they're looking, if they're pitching for investment, how, how to get what they, what they really want, what they really, really want? <laughs> Um, well, I think the, the, first thing to start, the first thing to start with is that when you get into the negotiation, it's not a fair fight. The, if you're selling the business, then the chances are that the, the business that you're selling to is bigger than you. If you're selling to private equity or, or um, a venture capital house, it's definitely bigger than you. Um, and they have professionals who negotiate day in, day out. Um, and I think if you accept that it's not a fair fight, it will allow you then to think about your answers in a measured way rather than reacting. Um, in a negotiation, uh, uh, and I've bought and invested in businesses, I'm not trying to trick you out, but I am trying to f get your measure. It's probably the first time that, that uh, it's serious time that we've stopped we're not going to be nice to you now we've been nice to you because we want to get to the negotiation stage we want to be the the primary person the primary um organization that's either going to buy you or invest in you but now we've got ourselves in that prime position now we're going to leverage it because now the gloves are coming off so from your point of view you need to be measured in your responses um, and the key thing I think I would start with by saying is, well, what makes a good deal? Um, most people will tell you that a good deal is a win-win. Um, and I would argue that's never a good deal. Um, how do you win-win when, you know, when you're a massive great gorilla going up against a dormouse? That's, there's no win-win in there. So my definition of a good deal is slightly um, left field, but it works for me which is that both sides need to hurt the same relative to their size. So um, you're going to give stuff up. A part of the negotiation, doesn't matter what side of the table you're on, you're going to give stuff up. But if both of you walk away from the deal thinking that you could have done better, then I would argue that's probably a deal that will work. That's a really good deal. Um, but when you're actually in the negotiation, the absolutely key thing is you've got to know your business backwards. It is no good pausing or saying, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, you have got to be on top of your numbers. You've got to be on top of your contracts. You've got to be on top of your staff. Um, you know, all the things that make the business work, you've got to know and have at your fingertips. Because that actually tells me whether you're any good as a CEO. Um, and if you're not that good as a CEO, then part of my equation might be, actually, I really like this business but I'm gonna to have to move you on. Either move you sideways or move you out. And that will become part of my consideration for the investment. And it becomes even more of my consideration if I'm buying your business. Um, so you've gotta know your business backwards. Um, I'd also suggest that you role play. 
get some friends, get them to play the investor. Don't give them a script, but give them some things that, you know, give them some ideas of what, what's likely to happen. But get them to role play. Role play is incredibly important. Um, and I'll give you a true example of this. I got hired to actually do the negotiations for a, a food company uh, dealing with Seagram's, the big Canadian company. So we flew over to Toronto um, and of course Seagram's, as you would expect, they wined and dined us, they took us around the plant, they made us feel fantastic, and then we got in the room. But the night we got in, the, before we got in the room, I'd taken the two owners of the business and we'd role played it. We'd role played it for hours. We got in the room, finished the deal, we got in the taxi, you go to the airport, the first words out of their mouth were, how on earth did you know that was gonna happen? Probably 95% of the things that we'd role played came up. Um, so role play really important because it prepares you and then it means that questions aren't a surprise. And the biggest thing that um, I say the investors or, or buyers are not looking to trick you up, uh, trip you up, but they are going to turn around and tell you that your baby is as ugly as sin. That it is not the business that you think is all wonderful, that it's got all sorts of problems. It's a negotiating tactic. If you've role played it, you'll be expecting that. Therefore, you won't react. If you haven't role played and you haven't done your numbers and you don't know your business backwards, you will react. Well, I win. You react, I win. Key thing about negotiations, you must be dispassionate. To you as the business owner, actually it's emotional. There is an emotional link with the business and that's a very, very strong link. To me as the investor or the buyer, it's business. It's not emotional at all. I have nothing invested in your business at all emotionally or otherwise. So as a consequence, I can be very hard. Um, if you react to that, if you react to what I'm saying, I'll know there are weaknesses there that I can then exploit. Remember I said a definition of a good deal, both sides hurt the same. If you react and I go digging, that's unlikely to be a good deal, if truth be told. Um, so that's really important. Uh, another key thing for negotiations, document all points as they occur and, and get them agreed immediately, but write them down. The number of times, I'm sure you've had this, Rob, the number of times, because negotiations take place over several meetings. It's not very rarely is it one meeting where the whole thing is decided and sewn up. But it's amazing how you can get to the third or fourth meeting um, and somebody says something, you go, no, 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 we agreed that in the first meeting. No, we didn't. But if at the end of the first meeting, you've written down all the points that were agreed and both sides have initialed and dated that piece of paper, there is no argument. There is no going back. Um, memory is very, very poor. Yeah. As humans, we tend to remember headlines, not detail. When you're in a negotiation, it's the detail that matters. Um, and also, I think as, a, as somebody yeah, that's like well, looking... I when we're... Go on, Rob. I was going to say, when, when we're representing clients, we will always facilitate a negotiation meeting. Um, it's that client that does the talking from our perspective, but we're there to facilitate because that's where it can be lost. Because when you're in the heat of battle, as it sometimes feels, you can often say things, once out, you've said it. And, and I, I know that clients will quite often um, forget what was in the documents go off at a tangent, say things that contradict the pitch deck or the information memorandum, and, and it's, it, it's out there. So, um, and sometimes the question, they're asked a question by the investor or the acquirer of the business, and our client sometimes only gives a partial answer. So we find that facilitating those meetings, we can perhaps give some extra information and, and perhaps put it into a proper context. context. Yeah, it's always helpful having two people, isn't it? Because if you're speaking for two, three hours, you'll, you'll get some things wrong. Oh, so yeah. Whereas if you're acting as a, a duo, one of you shuts up, the other one does the talking, but um, you're, the person who shuts up can listen to the responses coming from the other side of the table. Mm. Any no, further no, thoughts? Sure. Before, I've got another question that's come in from John. Any, anything else on negotiating um, that you wanted to uh, well, just two, Just two, two, two final points, uh, if I may. Um, yeah. uh, the first thing to understand is that investors are cynics. We have seen it all before. 
Um, so don't try and pull the wool over our eyes. You will get found out after I've given you my money. That's going to cause a breakdown in trust, and that's going to make for a very, very uncomfortable relationship. Um, and the lead on from that is you, as the person either selling a business or, or looking for investment, be prepared to walk away. If it doesn't feel right for you, it isn't right. And it's much better to walk away than hold your nose and jump into the water where there might be sharks and I'll be a shark swimming. So if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Yep, two good tips. And the question from John is, um, that's interesting. Um, do you see any downsides, Philip, in the working from home culture in companies sticking around longer term? For example, do you think you can find new companies completely remotely? Huh. That's really interesting because in my software house um, and my telco, when I started the telco, uh, we were all home working back in the late 80s, early 90s. In fact, in my software house, I've employed people around the world that to this day, I've never met. So I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm very comfortable with the concept of home working. And as an investor, if you told me that your business was home working based, that wouldn't bother me at all. Um, I know it would bother some people, but it wouldn't bother me at all. Uh, I think if you wanted to get into a wider discussion about whether home working is good for the economy as a whole we could be talking for, for a very long time on that and personally I think we need to uh, I think we're, we're going to struggle if we do go fully the country's not ready to be totally uh, home working based but there are a number of businesses and a number of industries that lend themselves to home working and, and I can see those growing rather than diminishing. And, yeah, they'll get I mean, and they'll get investment too, because I don't think there's any question about it that that is very much the future. I mean, you know, the, the internet now, can, we, we're all attached, we're all online, we're all attached to, to us, to our friends, our colleagues via the internet. Um, and more and more businesses will, I think, seek to, to exploit that so that they don't need big offices. Um, big hint here, I wouldn't be investing in commercial property just at the moment. Yeah, you yeah you want to uh, invest in um, undervalued assets, but I'm not I'm not giving in investment advice. <laughs> just a suggestion. It's my opinion. It might be completely wrong. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes I am wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just on that, as a sort of a, an adjunct to that point, um, obviously COVID around the world has accelerated in many countries the working from home culture. Um, Personally, I, I don't think it will disappear, no, um, I offices. I think there is something that's lost with the working from home culture, which is that social interaction. We've had a chat with our staff in Evolution. Um, there is something that you lose by not being, the, 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 the conversation around the, the coffee machine. And, and um, so there is something. We need to find other ways. I think it'll be a blended result once mm. we've got over um current issues i think it will be a mixture i think there'll be more people working from home you're right i think uh, the, the amount of uh, occupancy in commercial premises has already increased you just have to look around in our area yeah it gives a new set of issues i i completely agree with you about the need to I, I was be... say the... go on I, I was going to say, uh, just, Go just as a practical tip, because I've, I've remotely managed people in the last, th over the last 20 years, and um, I'm, I'm not so worried about monitoring uh, activity. Uh, I'm, I monitor output, because yeah. someone can be highly active and not productive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, most underperforming salespeople are highly active. Yep. But, but don't hit the all, targets. It's all about outcomes. And again, that comes back to trust. You know, the thing yeah. about homeworking is it's, it's very much trust-based and, and it's all about outcomes. If, you get the, if the business gets the outcome that it needs, homeworking is fine. But coming back to the, to the point you're making, Rob, I, think, I don't think offices will disappear. Um, 
because the the, the water cooler moment that's, that is one thing but the bit that actually i think a lot of businesses are starting to recognize is that there is a creative spark that takes place when people are together that doesn't seem to happen as well in the 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 zoom you know google meet microsoft teams environment um the challenge and you know when when an idea comes up the challenge that's instant when you are face to face gets lost a bit you know there's can be technological glitches we've talked over each other in this in this webinar once or twice um so i i don't think offices will die out in fact i think it's important offices don't die out because there is an ancillary industry lots of ancillary industries that are there to service offices that will will disappear um, so i think the shock to the system will be much too big uh, and i don't think they will die out but i think i think the um i think it will be a blend i think and i know if you look at some of the big accountancies you know a lot of the big accountancy practices now are saying well you know come into the office when you need to and, and people are coming in um sort of two or three days a week the other thing to bear in mind why offices i don't think can disappear is that how are our young people going to learn how work works if they don't have colleagues that they can look at uh, ask advice of be mentored by um you know i i, I mean i've got uh, uh, one son at university and another doing his A-levels. The, the future of work for them is going to look very different to the, to the future of work as it was for me when I was graduating. And I think that's something that people just need to be aware of because that's going to have a massive, massive cultural effect across the globe. Yeah. So I, I'm conscious of time, uh, Philip. So perhaps we, we could wrap up this session between us with the do's and don'ts of pitching for investment, um, what what would you say are the, the key things that you should be very mindful of, perhaps have imprinted on your mind or on a piece of paper somewhere discreetly hidden when you go into the uh, dragon's den pitching? Uh, some top tips so that people could be successful and got, get what they want. Okay. Um, they're actually quite, so there's not that many. Um, but I think they're worth bearing in mind. And the key one, I'm going to start with the don'ts, because um, I'm a great believer in ending on a positive note. Um, don't be desperate for investment. That desperation will come across, you'll send the wrong signal, it's going to make me nervous before we start. Um, don't try and blindside me. Uh, if you do, and I give you the money, I guarantee you will come to regret it. Uh, and as I mentioned not so long ago, uh, don't do the deal if it's not 100% right for you. Now the do's. Uh, really important, really important that you have complete understanding of your numbers. You must have financial control of your business. It is far too scary for investors to consider without. Funnily enough, it's not so important if you're selling the business um, because a buyer will recognize that you're not 100% on it, will we'll pull your stuff apart in due diligence, um, and if they're happy with that, they'll accept the risk. An investor won't accept that risk because they're not in control of what's going on. So you must know your numbers. Um, know exactly what you want the money for. Oh, and here's a tip. It's not to give yourself a pay rise. Um, you need to show me how my money is going to transform your business. And the key word there is transform. If it's just going to pay redundancies for people, or if it's going to pay for a new office block or a series of cars, not interested. I've got to understand how my money is going to completely change the way your business is going to grow. Um, so that's vital. Um, do have perspective. As I said earlier, you're selling. You're selling to the investor, you're selling to the buyer. So you need to walk in their moccasins. You need to keep perspective. You need to be thinking as they think. Um, and again, linking back, um, don't, don't gild the lily. I know I said I was gonna do do's at this point, but don't gild the lily. Be truthful, earn my trust by being truthful. And then the bit that we haven't talked about, but because it's a difficult process, but try and make the due diligence process as easy as possible. So set up a digital data room, 
put all your contracts in there, your HR, put all your policies in there, make it easy for me to get access to the data. Um, if I have to ask for data and then wait for you to give it to me, uh, that doesn't make doesn't give me warm fuzzy feelings. Whereas if I ask for something and you go, yeah, it's in the data room, then I'll immediately go to the data room and if I can't find it there, then I'll ask. It will speed the process up. It'll make my team happier. If my team is happy about it, they're going to trust what they're hearing. It's all about adding to that trust quotient. Um, so those are, the, yeah, that's probably my do's and don'ts as a very quick checklist. Yeah, so I'd add one more do. Um, if you're looking to raise investment, uh, do give Philip a call because he'll do an initial analysis of your business. Um, he's also fantastic to have as your number two when you go into battle because he's, he knows the dance. <laughs> the negotiation is a dance and it's very useful having someone that's been, knows the dance moves and has done it many, many times before. So do make sure you don't go in on your own thinking you, you can get what you want. Um, do go with somebody like Philip. So how, how, what's the best way of people getting in touch with you, Philip, and getting hold of perhaps the, um, the, the slideshow? Well, the slide uh, deck, I, I believe you're handling that. Um, I've got a slide deck okay. that uh, when I do this talk as a formal presentation, um, which I'm happy to, 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 to give out, um, on, at the end of that is my email address. Um, so that's a good way of contacting me. LinkedIn is a good way of contacting okay. me or finding me on my website. So if you, if you put Philip Delisle into Google, uh, you will find me because I've got first entries. Um, purely because I own the domain name, philipdelisle.com. <laughs> <laughs> he, he even owns, he even owns his own name. I do. <laughs> that's intellectual property at his best. <laughs> Look, thank you ever so much. You've been very generous with your time and also your tips from the other side. Um, so we, we do appreciate that, Philip. Thank you very much for your time. And um, we will, to everyone that's registered and been listening, thank you for your time as well. We will send you, uh, it'll probably be Isla, we'll send you a copy of the slide deck with speaker notes. So you've got an aid memoir there, but I would encourage you to get in touch with Philip direct if you're thinking about raising investment. Have him on your team. He's worth his weight in gold. Thank you. And uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rob. Take care now.